Good morning and welcome to Loose Ends, the programme that touches up the bits other programmes wouldn't dare reach for. Not Pick of the Week this week or for the next 13. Margaret Howard and one of my favourite programmes have both been promoted to a Sunday morning repeat at 11.15 for the overexcitement of family car washers. However, we hope, if we can encourage enough subversion in the ranks of studio engineers at the BBC, to inaugurate a new Not the Pick of the Week spot, devoted to the little bits that somehow didn't go out been a thin week, but you know the sort of thing, an audio equivalent of Dennis Norden's pension fund. Uh, this week's modest offering was committed on the recording session for Monday morning's Funny You Should Sing That, introduced by Jeremy Nicholas. <laughs> so, from Spike Jones, Flanders and Swan, Flotsam and Jetsam, Richard Stilgoe, Billy Bennett, Tom Lehrer, Yin and Yan, the heebie-jeebies. <laughs> heebie-jeebies. I, I think there might be a bit of that, but I'll try my best. Heebie-jeebies. Heebie-jeebies. Okay. However, to get back to the rest of the week, it's been one dominated by arguments over the New Year Honours list. In case you didn't read the small print in the Times, I can remind you now that it included among the OBEs were D. Gemmell, Managing Director of Possum Controls, N. N. Deering, Manager Small Business Sector, Domestic Banking Division, National Westminster Bank, and Mrs. E. Reid, Chairperson of the National Joint Council of Approved Driving Instructors Organisations. MBEs went, amongst others, to D. J. Huxley, Principal Doorkeeper of the House of Lords, A. Aitchison, Chief Executive Anglo-Scottish Fish Producers Association, C. Middleton, Bookbinder, Miss M. S. Howarth, Secretary of the British Malleable Tubes Association, and Miss E. L. Hobbs for services to water skiing, not forgetting R. Woods, Department of the Environment, Grade 6, who ran off with an Imperial Service Order. The press, in their small-minded way, ignored those worthy winners and concentrated on such minor events as a knighthood for Gordon Rees, who did so much for Mrs. Thatcher's image until he got a knighthood. If he'd really cared about Mrs. Thatcher's image, he would, of course, have advised her to give the knighthood to Bob Geldof. No prizes this year for Terry Wogan, whose Dynasty special provided an enormous ratings boost for Dallas. Wogan's New Year show on television made a change from the usual sentimental twaddle from north of the border. I almost said a welcome change. On Channel 4, Billy Connolly celebrated Hogman Eye by hanging upside down in a kilt, revealing a very well-worn joke. Over, rather than underdressed this week, was the BBC One controller, Michael Grade, who deftly publicised EastEnders by dressing up as a snowman and dancing outside a London pub. It's not quite the sort of thing Lord Reith would have gone in for, but then neither is EastEnders. In far-off Pakistan, cuddly, fun-loving General Zia celebrated the New Year by lifting martial law, whereupon his entire cabinet resigned. Mrs Thatcher immediately sent a telex asking exactly how it was done. The coming weeks may well see the resignation of Michael Heseltine, but at the moment he's still in there fighting courageously for Westland helicopters, or, as it's known in the trade, the future leadership of the Conservative Party. Anxious not to miss out on the publicity generated by Reagan and Gorbachev's New Year speeches on television, the GLC leader, Ken Livingstone, has been exchanging letters with Gorbachev on the subject of world peace. Mr Gorbachev seems to be impressed with Ken's claim that London has been declared a nuclear-free zone. Possibly no one has told him that London is about to be declared a Livingstone-free zone. It's not clear from the Soviet reply exactly where Mr Gorbachev stands on lesbian and gay rights, but it's thought that the Politburo may already have declared Moscow a lesbian-free zone. On Thursday came the news that the producer and presenter of Rough Justice have been suspended without pay on the grounds that they used brutal and intimidating methods of questioning people. The entire Metropolitan Police Force is said to be very worried. In a week traditionally thin on the news front, the Mirror fell back on a Turkey exclusive. It seems that turkeys were being kept in the deep freeze of a London morgue. This is, of course, the kind of thrusting, fearless investigative journalism upon which Robert Maxwell has built his reputation. However, it is heartwarming to know that he cares deeply about dead turkeys and will continue to support the Labour Party. Much frivol in the press this week, too, about the amorous rhythms of the pop stars. Midge Ure and Simon Le Bon are to be married, although not to each other. Toya is engaged, and it's reliably rumoured that Madonna is in the midst of immaculate conception. The only member of Duran Duran left unattached is John Taylor, who is always clean-shaven and never swears in public, so he stands a good chance of an OBE next year. Next week on Radio 1, Simon Bates and Bob Geldof are to engage in sub-gladiatorial combat. Geldof is very angry because Simon Bates criticised this distribution of live aid food in Ethiopia. Simon wasn't in the New Year's Honours list, which is strange, considering he's done nothing at all to help the starving in Ethiopia. Well, those are some of the loose ends of the week tied up, and to fiddle with a few more, we have a regular team of diligent knotters. The two getting knotted this week are Angela Gordon and Robert Elms. Let me try two brief descriptions on them and, and see how accurate their subjects think they are. Angela Gordon is the editor of Time's Gossip Column and perhaps the original 
fragrant hackett. Anything to quarrel with there, Angela? <laughs> fragrant hackett? I don't know. But, um, I've had lots of descriptions. That's private eye, isn't it? I think it, that one generally is referred to um, Lady Olga Maitland, not <laughs> Angela Gordon. <laughs> but I've told my mother to start worrying when it's uh, Ugandan discussions, as mentioned in private eye. Have you explained to your mother what Ugandan discussions are? <laughs> she, she wouldn't know. <laughs> no, I haven't. Robert Elms is a contributing editor on Face magazine, a trend watcher par excellence, perhaps a sort of baby Peter York for the 90s. Does that fit the bill, Robert? Uh, not that much of a baby anymore. Everyone keeps calling me young. I wish they wouldn't. I'm almost 26. Now we've heard you, would you rather be called the Derek Jameson of the 90s? I'll sue. <laughs> <laughs> not much else to In say. In that case, I, I, would, I withdraw it immediately if you're going to sue. Uh, now, we don't intend only to rely on regular contributors. Loose ends is a formula sufficiently elastic to admit actual guests, and we have several in the studio and on tape today. Let me introduce the first. He is a winner of the Queen's Award for Industry, an ex-editor and producer of the old Tonight programme, an ex-head of BBC Television Talks, the chairman of a firm called Leo Arts Television, the author of a best-selling book called Management and Machiavelli, and most topically, he's the co-author of the television series Yes Minister, about to reappear on Thursday as Yes Prime Minister. He is, of course, Tony Jay. Morning, Tony. Morning, Ned. Any, anything to quarrel with in that um, honours list? No, I really felt that uh, I'd really like to meet that guy and hear what he has to say, <laughs> and then I suddenly realised it was me, and I felt rather disappointed. Um, how, would, uh, how would Hacker react to, uh, to his first honours list, do you think? Oh, I think, um, knowing Hacker, and I've got to know him quite well over the years, um, I think that he would... I mean, there's an awful lot that just appears in an honours list, which the Prime Minister, presumably whoever he is, just says, yes, OK. But I think he'd have a particular interest in four areas of the honours list. And the first thing he'd be interested in is anything that associated him with the sort of things that would do him good with the electorate. So he'd want to, um, for example, he'd want someone, something concerning him with youth, because I'm sure he's concerned about the young people's vote, because that um, is the one that grows, rather, whereas the old people's vote in the sort of natural order of things tends, <laughs> tends to decline. Um, so I think he'd, be, he'd go for pop stars. He'd have at least one. He'd try and find out which one would be unlikely to disgrace him in the rest of his period of office. I think he would also be going for... Be Cliff Richard inevitably would do that. Um, that sounds likely if he's not a lord already. I'm not in touch with these <laughs> things. Um, Robert will do. Uh, he'd want to be associated with international success and Britain doing terribly well abroad. So he'd go for some international sportsman um, who'd won something overseas. And he'd... Uh, Sebastian Coe's about the most clean-limbed of those, I would have thought. Well, they're all very clean-limbed, aren't you? You watch their limbs as they go around these racetracks and you think how clean they are. Um, and then he'd want to be concerned with something caring, nurses or charities or something like that. That's his first area he'd be concerned with. The second one um, would be to give <coughs> honours to people who could give him publicity. So I think he'd look for um, newspaper editors, for example. Then he'd also be interested in political journalists who might write the nice articles about him and all the others were writing the nasty ones. And then people who could put him on radio or television. I think Lord Sherin might well um, <laughs> emerge as, as one of the surprise honours. Uh, Jim Hacker's Jimmy Young. Yes, I think, why not? And then the next lot he'd be looking for were the people he would be grateful to. Uh, and gratitude in politics confirms, conforms to the uh, description of a lively expectation of favours to come. Um, <laughs> and so he'd, the backbenchers who had helped him to get to number 10 Downing Street, or at least hadn't voted against him for the party, would... would um, and who are going to be necessary to keep him there during the rest of the Parliament, I think some of those would get knighthoods. I'm not... You wouldn't give them peerages, obviously, because that would put them out of their ability to go on voting for you, but you'd give them knighthoods. <laughs> um, party workers, I think, you know, people to help to get to there, particularly in your own constituency. I mean, we want to shower things around, because Jim, I don't think, has much time to look after his constituency, and the humiliation of not being actually returned while he's leader of the party <laughs> for his own constituency <laughs> would, I think, prey on his mind somewhat during those long night hours. And anybody who's subscribe major funds to his publicity campaign. But the, the area that I'm sure would come through enormously powerfully in, in Jim Hacker's on this list would be the civil service, because I think Humphrey's... I mean, it's quite extraordinary that 25% of the honours go to 1% of the population, and that 1% mm. is civil servants. And um, 125, I think, out of 500. I don't know how many you read out, but uh, that's OK, or was OK, I think, when, when rewards were very poor. Um, but uh, rewards are not poor now when your cabinet secretary gets £75,000 a year and index pension. In fact, in one of the episodes that's to come, we do have a suggestion that perhaps civil servants should have to choose between an index pension and honours. And they could only, if they got a knighthood, they'd have to trade it in if they wanted to keep their <laughs> index pension. Or, uh, it horrifies Sir Humphrey, I may say. It certainly doesn't come from him, obviously. No, on the contrary. It, it is fought by the norms. You'll see in episode uh, uh, five, I think. 
You're um, looking at the synopses of the various things that are, that are coming up. You seem to be uh, well ahead of the news, because you wrote this, what, uh, this, this series, what, um, half a year ago, and you, I, I noticed got uh, programmes about progressive bishops who criticise the government, a mercy mission to the Middle East by representatives of the Church of England, problem with nuclear <laughs> warheads. Is this just luck or, it, it's or just clever luck. prophecy? No, I'd love to think it was clever prophecy, or we knew what was coming up. We have no idea. It's, it's the yes minister luck. I mean, particularly the... Um, it's not complete luck. I mean, we had completed the episode on civil, top civil servants' pay rises in, um, in February or March, um, and there it was comfortably on the shelf waiting. And then the whole subject blew up in July with the top servants, civil servants' pay rise. We were rather cross about that. But uh, I think it's one of those subjects that won't die down and, we can, and is likely to recur. You say you've been living with um, Hacker over the years, and I was fascinated to, to, to read that the original... Sort of little nugget of uh, of an idea occurred to you in, or the, the the thing that triggered it occurred in as far back as 1961. Yes, was it 61? I thought it was one of 63. The Soskis. Yes, th that was extraordinary. Um, it, it was the first revelation I had. Tell our tell our young regulars how it started. <laughs> was then, I even born then? I was <laughs> 61, just weren't you? Just. Um, what happened? And and it was a really it was a sort of. I think I still think it was extraordinary. There was a, a, an enormous national petition led by the opposition, which was the Labour Party at the time, to give a free pardon to Timothy Evans um, because after the Christie had been discovered as the murderer, it was quite clear that mm -hmm. Timothy Evans had been wrongly convicted. And this was led by, the, I think it was the Shadow um, Attorney General or Sister General, who was Sir Frank Suskis. And he uh, got an enormous number of signatures on this petition and presented it was about to present it to the Home Secretary when he there was a general election and the, the opposition became the government and Sir Frank Suskis uh, became Home Secretary. Uh, whereupon he rejected the petition <laughs> <laughs> um, that, that he that he led and obviously there was something going on inside the Home Office, some enormous power totally unseen by the public which could make um, someone go through 180 degrees in 24 <laughs> hours and that, that was what first interested me in, in the area. I see. Obviously, rough justice wasn't around then. Mm, well, rough, there's been rough justice with small letters around <laughs> for a very long time. <laughs> it's become a worldwide popular. And I read that uh, it's being translated into Mandarin Chinese. That was lovely, wasn't it? I see that. Um, does it does it sell in America? Uh, it, it's uh, transmitted in America. We don't think it's enormously. Uh, widely viewed, yet it only started in the but autumn. Should it, should it have the same sort of treatment that Till Death Us Do Part? Should it have a translation into Yes, Senator, or Yes, Mr. President? Or we are thinking about that. The, the trouble is, it's really difficult to find a Sir Humphrey in American politics. The place is full of hackers. Mm. But when an American administration moves in, a new occupant uh, takes over the White House, he brings in 3,000 people or so with him who take over all the Sir Humphrey-type jobs and, indeed, the Deputy Secretary and Undersecretary jobs. So they're all staffed with party faithfuls. Has Mr. Hackett got any um, children in this series? I mean, it's the sort of thing a diary columnist would be interested. It's sort of Mark Thatcher lurking in the background. There, there's a daughter, Lucy. Uh, she's a, she, she has been in an earlier episode. She's only mentioned in this one. She worked for the Daily Telegraph. Oh, do you think she should? <laughs> Why Maybe not? she's the Times columnist. Uh, I should speak to Bill D. I have one <laughs> private theory that um, that when you're you're working on these scripts, that uh, you and your collaborator Jonathan Lynn, that you represent the Sir Humphrey figure and that he represents the Jim Hacker figure. How much do you think you're spokespersons for those two points of view? Um, I think there's an element of truth in that. Yes, I find it easier to think what Humphrey would do, and I think. Um, Johnny finds it easier to think what Jim would do. But that's a, that, there's an enormous amount of overlap. I mean, it happens the other way as well. Um, but I suppose when it comes to it, is that because you think I'm more of a, of a permanent secretary, really? No, it's, I think it's, the, the, it's the, the Mandarin quality, Tony. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> you can write it in Mandarin yourself, is it? What <laughs> our next, uh, just stay with us, because our, our next loose end is also a radio debut, and as befits a debutante, Matt Coward is going to go out and about striving each week for self-improvement. So here I was, 25 years old, if not in the first full flush of youth, then certainly not far past it and with only one great ambition remaining, to make myself totally perfect in every way. And where better to begin my quest than in the land of opportunity, the land of the free, the land where the little guy can go all the way to the top. <laughs> Get that.
that marriage proposal from the man of your choice. The secret revealed. Quickie divorce. Do it in a day from $175. Eliminate stress. Unwind with video of crackling fireplace. FDA approved beverage. Can arm your body against AIDS. I felt sure I was close to my goal as I browsed through my favorite mass circulation weekly. Stun gun immobilizes attackers with 40,000 volts. Share Anthony Quinn's secret of eternal youth. Suddenly I saw it in the religious section of the classified ads. Look at this. Be a Baptist minister. $25 for certificate of ordination and clergy card. And there's some more. Lifetime ordination. Many financial benefits, hello. Become a Catholic priest. Celibacy optional. Yes, well, that is a relief. Free lifetime ordination. Become bishop, evangelist, missionary, or chaplain. Yes, this is what I need. Just imagine the doors this could open. Time now for Thoughts for the Day. And this morning we're joined by Bishop Matt Coward. Good morning, friends everywhere. On my way to the studio, I was thinking, and don't we all think at some time or another? I know yes, I'm a Mark. Rabbi Blue, no contest. Oh, it's church like honour with my application. Let's see, this one's got a phone number. Good morning. Hello, is that the American Fellowship Church, please? Yes, it is. Oh, hello, I wonder if you can help me. I've seen your advertisement about becoming a legally ordained minister, and I, I just wonder if you could tell me more about it. Uh, we make this available as a service to people who, for one reason or another, are interested in an alternative way to become ordained. And it's our feeling that the ordination is between the person and God, and we do the paperwork. We have many lawyers and doctors and uh, university professors, and uh, we ordain many, many people in prisons. I do suspect that a number of them hope to seek some advantage for themselves by doing so. What sort of advantage, sir? I think some of them imagine that they might have a better chance of being paroled, which is not the case, of course. But we don't question them. If they want to be ordained, uh, we ordain them. Um, sir, I went, I, I'm sorry, I'm calling you sir. I, I didn't ask you your name. My name is Swenson, Ted Swenson. Is, is that the, are you the Reverend? Yeah. Swenson, yeah. How do I become ordained? Well, uh, simply uh, request that we ordain you. And uh, we, we ask for a $3 offering, and we send you some information about the church along with an identification card with your name and address typed on it, indicating that you are an ordained minister of our church and authorizing you to perform all uh, ministerial duties. You may uh, perform services, organize a church of your own, perform marriages, provided the jurisdiction permits. Are your ministers often called upon, do you know, to, to perform such services? Yes, uh, many are. Do you, Andrew Albert Christian Edward, take Selina Charlotte Alexander Lucy as your Lord? Tell me, Reverend Swenson, as, as far as my spiritual life is concerned, my and my lifestyle, I was, um, brought up an agnostic, although I'm not a practicing agnostic now, and I, I wondered if you felt that that would bar me from, from membership of your church. No, not at all. In fact, uh, we have had many people who have an agnostic uh, view who have joined us and have later felt that they have achieved considerable spiritual growth and development. Am I required or entitled to wear any particular raiment? That's strictly up to you. We don't prescribe or proscribe that. Do many of your ministers like to, to wear the full sort of outfit? Uh, some do, yes. Uh, I personally do not. Is there any sort of career structure within your church, without wishing to, to sound disrespectful? There's another advert to get on, on the same page of this extraordinary magazine, which, which uh, offers to make inquirers bishops. Do you have any higher ranks within your church? Well, we have special titles, uh, honorary titles. Anyone can have the title bishop if they want it from us. It's simply a matter of requesting us to do so. We have a certificate which uh, indicates that uh, you have been awarded the honorary title of bishop. And I don't know, we ask a 
something like $8, I think it is, offering for that certificate. Um, this week, under the 30-year rule, the Cabinet documents of 1955 were released, and although most commentators told us that there wasn't much there which was going to frighten the horses or tickle our fancy, and that the year to wait for is 1956, and we get those secrets in 12 months' time, there was one item which fascinated us. It conjured up a splendid picture of old Winston Churchill settling down in 1955 at 10 Downing Street to a good read of selected periodicals personally ordered, which included Captain Marvel, Jesse James, Frankenstein, and famous Yank crime comics. All this was in response to a 1950s movement to stop the 80 million a year circulation of violent, brutal and horrific books in a bill drafted by the Home Office. Just what the old boy made of Captain Marvel is not resolved, though as he was about to enter his second childhood he may have had a ball. The whole business sounds like the usual ritual of a uh, cycle of protests, sex and violence, it's got to stop. But it's rather more interesting that two years ago, before the subject became topical again, Martin Barker, a lecturer in philosophy at the Bristol Polytechnic, published a book, A Haunt of Fears, in which he argued that campaigners, the National Union of Teachers, WI, the church, the press, even radicals like Roy Jenkins and Michael Foote, got it all wrong. Mr Barker is in our Bristol studio, and to re-examine the controversy with him, we have here Dennis Gifford, author, broadcaster, quiz question compiler, editor of the complete catalogue of British comics, a man whose very name spells comic books, if you're better at anagrams than I am. Martin Barker, let's, let's go back to that 1954-55 controversy. Is it an oversimplification to, to say that you hold the, the point of view in the first place that um, these horror comics, which were so reviled at the time, were a good, not a bad influence on children, and that secondly, um, the opposition was in fact part of a, a communist plot. Yes, I think that about captures my view perfectly. Uh, first of all, they weren't really horror comics except a few of them. In fact, the, the term horror comic was a term they coined in 1954 to sum up, well, the range of things you said, Captain Marvel, the Western comics, a few war comics, a few horror titles with wonderful titles like Haunt of Fear, hence the title of my book, and they slapped a label on them because they really wanted to to get rid of them without looking at them. And that was one of the things I found when I was researching the campaign. I went and interviewed a lot of the people who were still alive from the campaign, and I asked each one of them, well, what did you talk about the comics, and when did you meet to discuss? And they looked at me in surprise and said, I don't think we ever did. And I think, therefore, it showed up that people were having what someone called the other day a knee-jerk reaction to the things. As far as it being a communist plot, that was the really curious story that I uncovered. And this was that all the people who were centrally involved in the campaign, right through to the entry of the NUT in late 1954, were all leading members of the British Communist Party. Now, I don't say that because I think it's a red plot. I actually think they did themselves a deal of harm, in fact. Is the word leading perhaps an exaggeration? Members, but perhaps not leading members? All right, then, members. I'll, I'll let you have it since it's a new year. <laughs> And, uh, but what were they hoping to gain? I mean, what devious communist purpose was being um, helped here? Well, you see, in the very early years of the campaign, because it started as early as 1949, in the early years of the campaign, their aim was to create an anti-American movement. And indeed, they called the comics the leading element in what they called American cultural imperialism. Now, unfortunately, as you know, it was the middle of the Cold War, we had the Korean War and so on, and it wasn't very popular to be a communist in those days, even worse so than now. And because of this, they decided that the only way they could actually have an influence was, in, fact, in effect, to go underground and to do it quietly without really revealing their, their particular motives. And that's why all the, this, the talk of cultural imperialism very quickly vanished. And instead we got, instead of American imperialism and British nation national tradition being defended, we got horror to children. Dennis, do you, uh, were you aware of this communist plot at the time? Uh, no, I wasn't, of course. Um, I didn't think uh, people like the Reverend Marcus Morris was a communist, because he was the real leader of the um, British uh, attack on horror comics. Can you, can you distinguish between the two? Because when we say comics, one tends to think of the Beano or Rockfist Rogan RAF. Uh -huh. um, wh wh what exactly was the specific difference between <coughs> your good, clean-cut comics and... Yeah, uh, well, comics? it was indeed the difference between America and England. It was in the fact that the American children had been, bro had been brought up on comics, um, and as they grew up, they still wanted to read comics, so comic books were really created for an older generation. For ill-educated American adults, and then uh, being peddled here to... Uh, yes, many, many... Th in fact, the basic reading of the GI during the war was uh, comic books. I mean, the huge circulations attained by American comic books was because they were being shipped over um, with their, to their NAFI, or whatever it was called, I've forgotten mm. the word for it, their post-exchanges. PX, PX, um, PX's, yes. And, um, 
uh, read by the American, and of course they they upgraded, uh, upgraded perhaps isn't the word, set the sex and violence content to appeal to the 18 year olds, 19 year olds, 20 year olds who were fighting in the war. Um, all these eventually sort of came, and, and they, they, it was a kind of an underground here. I mean, when I was, I was at school at the time, and certainly there was a great trading going on of American comic books at that time, all of which were, you know, I was 14, 15, 16 reading them, and so were all the boys at our school, and uh, we'd all grown out of the Beano and the Dandy and that kind of comic at the age of 11, which was the tradition, you know, when you left your young school, you went on to a higher school, and you left comics behind you and went into The Wizard and the Rover and so on. And, of course, these comics suited our taste no end. I mean, we, we found them all very exciting at that time. But we were older, you see, and I think the big problem was that the, the American comics went straight to... Uh, British children who were quite unprepared for them. You know, they went on sale when they did go on sale just after the war. They went on sale in the news agents, racked alongside the you, Beano's and You Bandit. don't share Martin Barker's view that they were that they might have been harmless, I take it. Oh no, no. I think they they were they weren't harmless to the teenager, to the adult who was, who they were intended for in America. Yeah. They were never intended for children. And you you think they're positively good for for little tots, do you, Martin? Well, you see, I think you've got to be careful how you say that, but certainly I don't think they were ever harmful. I certainly think they were harmful for adults. They were harmful for adults because they caused apoplexy, heart attack, and, and brain seizures in so many adults. It wasn't the children who were worried by reading these things straight after the Beano. I, I was told a wonderful story by a, a man I interviewed in Bristol who had read them as a child, and he said that in their playground they used to have a swap value. You could swap heart one American colour original for six British black and white reprints, and they had their own trading standards. That you know, a torn cover meant that it was worth only five, and uh, a back page missing meant that it was only worth four. And you had quite a complex alternative money system among the kids based on these horror comics. Really glad that you gave me the chance to try one of these sort of television dish satellite things, because they cost over a thousand pounds. You know, I mean, it's a lot of money, even for a Christmas present these days. And what's worse is I'm not a very technical bloke, so I don't like to have anything like that without trying it. I mean, I used to, when I was a kid, you'd get Rupert books, and there was always that page where the Mandarin's daughter would show you how to fold a newspaper like that, sort of, along the dotted lines, and you were supposed to find that you'd made a sort of serviceable electric wok. But I could never get mine to stir fry very satisfactorily. But here, they give me a try around these television channels, and all I've got to do is press a little button. So let's first see what's in the satellite dish of delights. <laughs> and the first station is Music Box, which is a pop video station. You're watching the Music Box number one's part two with Suni myself. Ah, as you can see, there, there are two presenters in this. They, they smile vacantly quite a lot of the time and say, right then, and oh dear. Right then. Oh dear. He thinks he can get away with it. <laughs> yes. uh, enough of this. <laughs> quickly, quickly, before they switch us off. Um, <clears throat> Too late. Oh, that was close. We nearly got the music in there. What a relief. Th this next station that we're going to look at is CNN Rolling News. Straight away that you'll see that the, the girl is the all-American television girl. Uh, well, she looked like somebody who failed an audition for Dynasty, but being a game girl got up and settled for being an air hostess. They all look the same, and they've all got that same sort of airport speak, haven't they, where they can kind of accent any word and punctuate at any point because it doesn't matter what they're saying as long as the style is maintained and she might lapse into a comma at any moment. I believe she is talking about science. 1986 has dawned upon us, and it uh, seems to be that it will be a very exciting year for space exploration in a lot of ways. For example, there are 15 scheduled shuttle launches for this brand new year and also a lot of other space activity. Joining us now She's sat on the screen here with a professor. They're on a sort of split screen. They look as though they're sort of sitting, looking out at us in, in adjacent toilet cubicles. His box is labelled Los Angeles and her Atlanta. It looks rather as if he's hearing her confession, which I suspect could take quite a long time. So let's move over to the Keep Fit Network. Hey, gang, this is Jake, buddy, by Jake, with your... Hi, friend, Jake. Uh, he's tremendously well-developed from the eyebrows side. down. You use a towel, and it works for your arms and your back. And what makes it real fun is that you can use your pal. 
I should make it clear that his pal is another All-American girl, a sort of grin on legs, and the legs stretch right up to her armpits. Bring it back the other way. Let's go for a five count. Ready? One. The exercise certainly seems to have worked pretty well for her because she's got tremendously well-developed, uh, what do we British call them? Brits call them bangers. I think it's the right pronunciation, bangers, if you want to say it in uh, more Americanese. Bangors. <laughs> no, that's bangamane. Anyway, they're sausages to you and me here in the U.S. Our correspondent Richard Wystone managed to crawl out of bed this morning <laughs> to cast a blurry eye on a bang-up bicentennial breakfast bash in London. These people lined up in downtown London on New Year's morning. Where, where exactly is downtown London, Ned? Because if we'd known, we could have got a free sausage. But of course, a free sausage would mean nothing to a man like you, because you're a man of the arts. Let's look at the arts channel. Huh. And who's this friendly little fellow? Seems to be a man doing something, dancing, I think. A performance. A mime? He used to have no clothes on. Or has he? What's he doing with his leg? Is it his leg? No, no, no he'll never get it there. Ugh! Ha ha! World Net! This is Today WPN! And their main story seems to be Bruges, the Venice of the North. And speaking of cliches, Almost everyone agrees that 1985 was a year of highs and lows, a year of winners and losers. In well, this report, it's sure not the philosophy channel. Most <laughs> and this next one isn't either. This is Lifestyle <laughs> Channel, which is very popular in America. Dr. Ruth Westheimer apparently gives sex therapy lessons on the television. Welcome to Good Sex, with Dr. Ruth Westheimer. Hello, you are on the air. Hi, Dr. Ruth. Hello there. My name is Paul. I'm calling from Clearwater, Florida. Hi there, Paul. My uh, question is, yeah. I really enjoy my nipples to be squeezed. Yes. Is that uh, anything wrong with me there? No, absolutely not. Uh, there's nothing wrong with a man uh, liking um, his breast caressed or the nipples squeezed. Do you have to drive her someplace? I'm having difficulty hearing you, Dr. Ruth. Yeah, do a uh, poll. Well, that's proof something. At last, the source of all of secrets has come up with something. I mean, I would have thought that having your nipples tweaked was painful enough, but having it tweaked by somebody who lived in a different house would be excruciating. And did you notice at the end that, as his scoutmaster probably warned him, makes you go deaf? But there's none so deaf as can't hear the news in Arabic. <laughs> You know, I think Lord Reith, if he was here, would be pretty pleased to find that, due to this sort of satellite dish, nation can speak unto nation. Uh, Robert, it's good that we have you here as our London expert. We were asked uh, during the course of that uh, just exactly where downtown London well, was. Would you care to spot it for us? Downtown is, of course, a state of mind and fashion. But um, this week, downtown, desirable downtown, is definitely the neon streets of the Soho Tenderloin. That's where you should be. <laughs> I shall do my best to avoid it. In an age when you can hardly open a magazine or switch on a program without being made aware of a new trend or fashion of which you'd previously been blissfully ignorant, we thought we should play our part in making you feel slightly out of step. Robert Elms is a specialist in first sightings and he's been out with his tape recorder tucked under his arm. Robert, what's the trend and to which part of the empire did it take you? Uh, well, the trend is, is definitely young trendies, going where before the money Winston Churchill and those members of the royal family who don't wear dresses had ever gone. Um, they're walking through the, the old streets of Mayfair to expose their Adam's apples to the open blade. I went and got shaved for the very first time at the uh, High Temple of Barbering, Geo Trumpers. Good afternoon, sir. May we help you? Yeah, uh, I have an appointment, I believe. And your name, sir? Mr. Elms. Mr. Elms. Yes, Mr. Elms, you have an appointment. Mr. Norman at 11.30. If you take it on the right, sir, Mr. Norman will be with you in Certainly. a few moments. I trust he knows how to use that razor. I think he will, sir. Thank you. Hands there, sir. Thank you. Make yourself comfortable. I've never had one done, so this is my... I'm a, a, a virgin shavee here. Oh, that's good. You've got a face that's, that's never right. been worked on. No, I suffer thing, from yeah. pre-shaving tension. Yeah, I get PST yeah. when I'm going to bleed. It's as no. simple as that. I'm worried. No. You if sure? you get vitamin E oil and cream yeah. and put on there, you won't bleed. Really? Vitamin E is very good. Mm. Yeah. 
it's an open, traditional cutthroat rose. I mean, it's Sweeney Todd stuff. It's like I'm going to end up yeah. in a mince pie if you will that. This was made in the first, before the first world. The war. actual one was. Yeah. Well, you put the hot towels on to begin with, you know, and then you lather up and then you shave and everything. Oh my God, this hot. This man has just wrapped a pink towel around my head so that I can no longer see, but I can certainly feel that it's a very hot pink towel. Marvin. What's the brush made from? Badger. Is that the best? Yeah, well, it's because it holds more sun. That's oh. why. And it feels good, doesn't it? Mm. Soft. Yeah. I would up these stropping. What are you doing there? This is a lost art. Well, the stropping's a lost art. Are you sharpening the razor? Yeah. Is that where the word strop comes from? Be mm. stroppy or? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Not many people know that. <laughs> Oh, the noise. It really does sound as if you've got a colony of something rather horrible crawling across your face. I won't talk too much or I might die. Do you shave with the hairs or against them? Or? No, you would go with the grain like I'm doing now. Yeah. Always go down, never go up. If I was to go up with this, this will catch it to pieces. Right, because I have so to I go up see, with a razor. No, you don't. You must come down. See, because I can see where you've cut yourself here. Yeah. Open the pores up too much. Have you noticed the change in the customers recently? They're getting younger instead of older. You used to get the 50s upwards coming in. Yeah. Now it's under that. You've got the 30 group coming in. <laughs> that wasn't pain, just wonderment. Anyone can get that close. Is this powder? That's very wonderful. It, feels, it just feels like a cat is wagging its tail across your face very gently. How nice. That's worth every penny. What a shave. Did you find it an enjoyable experience? It was a bit worrying. It, afterwards he told me that he'd been to school with um, the Cray twins and used to be their barber. I, <laughs> I was glad he didn't tell me before. The other thing that was a little bit daunting was that there was a, a very large picture of Winston Churchill staring at you from the booth, which apparently <laughs> was the one he always used. And I thought I might end up looking like that. Any, any, uh, any young royals in there, Big Shave? Not at the time. There were a few young people in there. And I actually found an old school friend of mine was now working there as a barber, which is equally worrying. Did they do your legs as well? <laughs> Waxing, Wax I think. Oh, oh. It's, uh, it's fascinating. I, I was driven to think that a new fashion might bring back an old disease, because uh, I can remember my father going to, to barber's shops to be, to be shaved, and uh, the, there was a terrible risk then that if the if the, the blade wasn't entirely clean, you'd get something called barber's itch or barber's rash. I think the, I've forgotten the, the technical, it's psychosis or something like I that. that. You talked about um, a, a colony of something rather horrible cre creeping around, around your around your face, and that's in fact what happened when people got barber's rash really? in the old days. I, I think it's you? an even more worrying thing than that. You could get, you know, a new disease, I mean, I did ask them about AIDS, and they just kind of <gasps> looked in horror and said, "We don't get that kind of gentleman in here." <laughs> but do you have to do you have to be shaved every morning, there? Well, no. I mean, it shaves you so close that you actually didn't. I didn't have to shave at all for a couple of days. I'm not being the most hirsute of people. No, really done anyway. <laughs> you look it's very not soft. cheap. It's six pounds a time. <laughs> Will you go back? Um, only if they're going to give me it free again, I think. <laughs> do you think they'll start singing again in barbershops like they used to? With I think the, the worrying pets? thing going there to be shaved is, is that terrible temptation they have to tell you jokes, isn't it? Uh, oh, yeah. Which is all right if they're just cutting your hair, but it can be a good deal more dangerous yeah. if, they're, if, they're, if they the They don't have to say that mysterious phrase, was there something else so afterwards now? Of course, you can get them out of um, Anywhere. slot machines, can't yeah. you? Yeah. I wondered if you'd like to send me to Princess Di's hairdresser, but I suppose his hands are a bit shaky now. It is actually <laughs> much more to do with the paraphernalia, though, I think it's... It's all part of that desire to kind of have you know, wonderful things from the Empire, as you said. Do you have a feeling for, uh, for a shave, a close shave, Tony? I, I wouldn't like it, I think, because I'd, it's rather like being the dentist, isn't it? You're in that position at someone's mercy. Mm. When you're lying on your back you're, or on, uh, in a chair, you're at his mercy. He's got terrifying implements, and it, you feel if you move your mouth, something terrible will happen, so you just have to listen all the time. I think I shall stay doing it, my, doing it myself. I don't know whether you intend travelling on a bus this morning, or indeed if you ever travel by bus, but if you do, you'll know what an immensely absorbing experience it can be. I was on a number 11 the other morning, one actually came along, and a little woman turned to me and said, you're not the sort of person you expect to see on a bus. Well, there's no answer to that, is there? Anyway, you're sitting there, surrounded by people you've probably never seen before and never will again.
again, having completely relinquished the control of your own destiny into the hands of a driver you've also never met before. And the only thing you have in common with your fellow travellers is that for a few minutes at least, you have the luxury of nothing much to do except contemplate your own navel. What better place then to begin an investigation into the complexities of human nature? And for that reason, we sent Nigel Farrell out on a variety of different bus trips up and down the country to eavesdrop on people's conversations and to freeze a particular moment in time. <laughs> well, I'm going to a funeral tomorrow, so I can't oh, yeah? think of that, yes, in the morning, yes. So I shan't be on in the morning. It's my niece, tomorrow morning. So uh, that's a bit, it's a very sudden heart attack, she's only 26. Oh, my goodness. Oh, yeah, left a baby, nine months old. Mm. So we've got that to look forward to tomorrow morning. On a bus, anyway, the tragedies and triumphs of the human predicament can be publicly and unashamedly yeah. shared any time any day of the week. On the number 88, as it ploughs through the frosty darkness of Tooting en route to Ballam and Clapham, they get down to things early. She's very young, though, was she? Yeah, she lost her other daughter the same way, like two years ago. She was 24. Long yeah. before dawn, Lillian and Marge are steaming up the windows along with two dozen other cleaning ladies who will be spending breakfast time cheerfully vacuuming the offices of the rich and powerful in Westminster and the West End. The early morning cleaners were the best you could come across, believe me. Yeah, lots of fun and that. But like everything else, we've got old, I suppose, things have altered. Not for the better, I don't think. Morning. Who's that? Oh, she's another lady that gets on, been coming on some years. On that, she works for the government. House of Commons. You're going to the House of Commons? You're not an MP. No, you've got to be joking. No, I'm a cleaner. Oh. I'm in the arms department. Are they very clean lot, MPs? Yeah, dirty baggers. <laughs> How long have you been travelling on this bus for? 36 years. 36 years ago, this was bombed out, this area, wasn't it? Most of it, yes, most of it. All the way around, really, all the buildings were after the government, weren't they? Did you lose your own house in the bombing? Yes, I did, yes. I broke it off here. Right. Cheerio See then, dear. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye. See you. Thank you. Later, in one of those offices, which by then should be gleaming with spit and polish, a young American could find his life turned completely upside down. His name's Eugene, and long after the cleaning corps have departed, I find him peering out of the front of the bus and looking immaculate, in creaseless pinstripe, dazzling cufflinks and tie pin, and blindingly perfect white teeth, which radiate the ring of confidence. I'm going to a job interview, but... Uh... The uh, taxi system and the subway system here doesn't seem to be sufficient to get people around in this town. It's for consulting company. Uh, marketing, financial strategies, uh, business strategies as to what they're going to do in the future. It'd be pretty, it would have been nice to, to be there about 10 minutes ago, but uh, it doesn't look like it'll be possible. So you're going to be late for the interview? Yeah. Is that going to stand against you? Uh, it certainly could. It uh, isn't going to make my life any easier when I get there, that's for sure. News just in, the 2,000 teenagers whose New Year's party totally wrecked an unlocked £5 million mansion in Hampstead have been invited to apply for a GLC grant. But they've turned this down on the grounds that their private enterprise has already won them the job of running Westland helicopters. Good morning. Two Cents was presented by Ned Sherin and produced by Ian Gardhouse, Simon Shaw and Cathy Marnie.